There was a need at some point where some caveman said, you know what, I keep forgetting the fact that my wife tells me to pick blueberries after the mastodon hunt. This keeps happening over and over again, and finally he discovers that he needs some sort of memory device, some sort of tool that allows him to remember to do something or that something occurred. And during the Sumerian period, when the clay cuneiform tablet was invented, it wasn't done for some romantic reason. It was the equivalent of the Sumerian IRS agents who kept asking different farmers for taxes. And the farmers basically said, you already got that information or you already got the taxes yesterday. Well, finally, the Sumerian equivalent of the IRS says, basically, we need some sort of memory device to remember who we basically collected taxes from. The art and science of storytelling has been aided and abetted by changing technology in terms of media formats or media packages. They sort of reflect the civilization that they came out of. They provide access to this information or the story that's being recorded. Uh, the second thing it does is it preserves that story over a long period of time or sometimes a short period of time. One of the things that libraries do is they also sort of form its own gigantic information package because they also serve a role in terms of preserving or providing access to these documents of enduring value. One of the first times that we really come across a library is the library of Ramses II. That's about 1200 to 1300 BC. A library is different from an archive, which the Sumerians had quite a few of, and the Babylonians and the Akkadians. But what's unique about Ramsey's library is that above the doorway was written, Healing Place of the Soul. So we knew from just that sort of inscription there that we were dealing with a building that didn't just store government records and tax receipts and things like that, but actually materials that were sort of insightful, that were inspiring, that basically caused the Pharaoh to think, you know what, I really like this place. This is a library, this is a place where I can relax, it's quiet, I can have contemplative thought. In ancient Egypt, you had enough leisure time that actually children's literature was being created. One of the first Cinderella stories on record actually came out of ancient Egypt. So it's really unique to see how ancient Egyptians move storytelling forward based on the fact that they had such a sophisticated civilization that allowed for that. Fast forward to the late Roman Empire, and we have a new media format that leaves the scroll behind. So a codex is essentially a group of documents that's uh, tied together on one side, and then there are two hard covers on either side. A spiral-bound notebook is a codex. A current Bible is a codex. Your textbooks in college are, are codices. The codex really takes over the scroll and the role of the scroll by the Middle Ages, actually during the, Roman, the late Roman Empire. A gentleman by the name of Aurelius Cassiodorus around uh, 485 AD was in a monastery and he, and he trained his monks to make very accurate manuscripts, beautiful manuscripts. And so he starts the medieval manuscript tradition by creating a rule that says to his monks, I want you to go ahead and make accurate documents, but I also want you to make them beautifully illustrated because this is the word of God. And so that's why they kind of make these beautiful manuscripts that start from the, the 600s all the way up to 1450. Around 1450, around the height of the medieval manuscript period, Johann Gutenberg decides to invent something that creates artificial script and mass produces the manuscript. What he's trying to do is create something that allows him to profit off of the medieval manuscript tradition. And the first thing he does is create this press and it flips the whole paradigm. What used to take 1,500 man hours to create one manuscript, now he goes ahead and creates 1,500 copies in one hour or one day. And what that does is create an awful lot of stories to share with everyone. By World War II, we needed to have some method of storing even more and more amounts of information onto a smaller area. So what starts to happen is we invent different types of media formats, magnetic media, microcards, microfiche, all these different formats to try and store more and more information. For example, a microcard. This is actually something that is sort of a hybrid 
of an ocular record, one that you can read with your eyes, and also one that is machine readable. And a machine readable record is a record that you have to have a machine in order to actually read the entire record. Once we get into the microfilm period, we start seeing in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s massive microfilm collections trying to store all these stories that we've created over time. By the 1960s, the internet was up and running, and this allowed stories to change. They became electronic, instant, and fluid. Then in the 1990s, it switched over to sort of a graphical user interface, and this allowed those stories to migrate to more of an audiovisual format. And this also led to a lot of different ways of telling those stories, such as blogs, which are temporary in terms of their nature and what they're sharing, but also things like Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, even something like Second Life is a different sort of platform or media to go ahead and share storytelling. One of the things that we see over time is this perpetual willingness and need to share stories with one another, to kind of create this ongoing narrative. When we see the ancient Egyptians doing it, they're putting on papyrus. When we start seeing folks in the Middle Ages doing it, they're writing on parchment and manuscripts. And this continues today. We all want to kind of share our stories, provide access to them and share them, and also preserve them, whether it's just for a few days or for a few centuries.